Welcome to the long. This will be a more definitive guide to making trousers than my previous efforts, benefiting from much more experience and understanding on my part, but still based on the same things we've used previously. I want to keep this thorough but accessible, therefore I'm just going to leave out some things that I've learnt since first learning trousers so that it isn't too much at once. Those will come later. There's my trouser accoutrements video, so I'm not going to go too deep into what you need, but the basic rundown, banroll canvas, hook, bar, buckles for side tabs should you desire them, silicia, about half a meter, a small amount of linen, holland linen, fusing, a few two centimeter by two centimeter squares, Lining, about half a meter again, a zip, and a button. I'm going to assume from now that your lining isn't polyester or nylon, and can take a hot cotton setting. And I won't stop to remind you of that again. This is one of two videos, basically the same, except, except that one is more an extended cut. Occasionally, I can't decide on whether to cut something or let it play out, so... I haven't decided, I've just chosen both. Both videos will be identical in content, but if you want to see me doing something in more clarity, or for a bit longer, or both times occasionally, it might be in the extended version. Both will obviously be timestamped in the exact same way, so that you can find your way between them. I suppose. I like trying to convey information as densely as possible, but I still find myself ooh erring about whether to cut something or keep it in sometimes. You need to start by making sure that your fabric is okay, and that you have enough. I rolled my fabric out, salvaged towards me, and laid my front and back pattern onto it. Check the right side, which is neatly preserved on the inside. Make sure that no threads are pulled anywhere, stains, I guess, also. And the last thing is to make sure that the selvage is lined up, at which point it's important to iron the fabric. Thoroughly steam it in order to pre-shrink it so that your trouser will be actual size. Laying the patterns you made onto the fabric, you should be aware whether the pattern goes one way, so whether the pattern has an upside down, and by extension, should you not have enough space to line the patterns up. As is, you could flip them horizontally and you'll get the same two patterns, that you wouldn't get if you flip them vertically. Run your hand up and down the fabric because it might have a pile which manifests in being smooth one way and rough at the other. You need to make sure that you have at least an extra 5cm below the hem of the patterns, 2.5cm above, and the two have 2.5cm two between them. The hems are going to flare out from the trouser, which will make the slant easier to put in. We're not going to make a cuff right now, but if you wanted to, remember to add 8cm more to the bottom, and you wouldn't be able to slant it like that. The most economical way of doing this is to flip one side upside down. Of course we can't do that if it has a pile or a pattern that makes it ineligible. The next best way might be to flip one of the patterns over. As a rule though, I like the front pattern always the same way up as we drafted it, because it keeps fitting up more consistent for me. Another important aspect of laying down the patterns is to make sure that they are in line with the grain. Maybe the best way of doing that is measuring from the center line of the trouser to the fold or to the selvage, whatever happens to be easier for you. You're best measuring from one point and then using that as a pivot point to measure the other point. Otherwise you might be playing a game of whack-a-mole. Upon getting them into position, you ought to use some kind of weight to keep everything in place. One time I used bars of soap 
Another time I used whiskey glasses. It was an enjoyable one that time. At this point, begin to trace around both patterns. Progress as you wish, but be sure to take down all the balance marks, like the seat knee construction line between those two. And very importantly, the dart and front crease line. We don't necessarily need the center back line, but we do need the center front. Using a piece of sharper chalk is best, and to chalk, don't apply too much pressure. Applying too much pressure will create thicker, less precise lines. It could also move the fabric, changing where the ch chalk is in the first place. Plus, it'll wear out the chalk more quickly. Try to use the chalk vertically, so at a 90 degree angle to the fabric. It helps using the chalk sharply. As you finish tracing around the patterns, the paper becomes redundant and you can or should remove it. The first inlays you should draw on are the additional 5cm below the hem and the additional 3cm atop the waistband. These are on both patterns and are all the inlays you need to put on the front pattern at all, remembering to flare out beyond the cuff. On the back pattern, however, there is an additional 2.5cm of inlay around the rest of the pattern as well, except for the rise. On the rise, at the top of the back pattern, extend the waistband by 3cm and that will taper in as it goes down towards the curve. To determine the fly bearer fork notch, make a right angle at the four part curve from the fly line and the crotch and carry on the straight line of the centre front down a bit. Mark 45 degrees from that onto the curve. About halfway between that and where the line is straight again is where you could put your notch. For ladies, it might be better at the bottom of the straight, for genitalic reasons of course. Lower than that for blokes, and in my experience the zip can be slightly more difficult to operate. It's at this point that you can draw on the trouser pocket, unless you want a fitting, then that can come later. Should you want a straight pocket, you decide on a length and mark 1cm at the top and bottom where you want the pocket, and then join those up. Should you want a slanted pocket, you need to decide on a slant. I suggest marking the seam allowances under the inlay and around the appropriate points on the side seam. I'm starting the slant 5cm from my side seam, which will be 6cm from the edge of the fabric. Then I decide on the length of my pocket usually 18 centimeters, but with three centimeters of non-pocket above it. So from the point we marked below the inlay, find where 21 centimeters meets the side seam, not the edge, the side seam. This will be our bottom notch, while the three centimeter point is our top notch. You may want to replace the weights at this point as you cut the pieces out, and as the fabric is cut loose from patterns, be sure to mark the grain onto them. We're going to use those bits to cut out the other little bits we need from the same fabric. As we're cutting, keep your hand next to where we're cutting to keep the two layers the same size. If you have an island worktop, it, that's way better because you can move around the table as you cut. Otherwise, we're stuck contorting ourselves to cut everything out. biggest part we need is our waistband. We don't actually need a pattern for the waistband since it's a rectangle of 6 centimeters by half the waist measurement plus 16. It doesn't need to be exactly 6 centimeters wide, it can be wider so long as it has one straight edge. Could be a long piece of scrap from the selvage or folded edge really. Always be sure to mark the wrong side and like I've said previously the waistband is cut along the same grain as the trouser. This can be a bit complicated because the fly guard needs to be right side up when it's attached to the inside of the right trouser. 
I've laid the left trouser correct side up, or right side trouser correct side down, same thing, onto some fabric, still following the same grain. This is the same as my previous zip video, except different measurements because I thought it was too big. Start by copying off the knot, curve, inlay, and waistline, at which point remove the trouser and draw a perpendicular line away from the curve a few centimeters down from the notch. Mark points 4 centimeters and 5 centimeters on that line from the curve. From the top, also chalk a line 5 centimeters from your first line and hand rail the first curve about halfway around before splitting it into two lines, one going to the 4 centimeter point and one to the 5 centimeter point. At this point, extend the waist and the inlay lines. Now decide on the shape and dimensions of your fly guard, bearing in mind that this dimension will have a centimeter shaved off of it when it's bagged. I went for 4 centimeters at the top, which was another 4 centimeters below the waistline, which is curved into the fly. Be sure to mark stitch or cut the notch and cut out the patterns that you drew. Split the mark stitch if applicable and then on the piece of fabric that you drew on, cut away the extruded block at the top and also the small curve at the bottom. That is your fly. Do mark the wrong side of the fly guard. If you get it the wrong way round, you'll be somewhat displeased. For the back pockets, should you want them, mark the appropriate pieces that you need. Obviously it changes depending on the pocket you want, but for my double welted pocket, two jets of 19cm by at least 5cm, and the bearer 19cm by at least 10cm. Keeping in mind that the jets are cut long side with the grain, like the waistband, and the bearer is cut long side perpendicular to the grain. Again here with the belt loops I'm just illustrating that it's the long side is with the grain. Blind and facings for your front pocket also need to be cut. Lay your trouser over some fabric, and if it's a patterned fabric and a slanted pocket, then definitely be sure to line up the pattern. Trace around the outside, being sure to carry on an extra 10cm down from the bottom of your pocket, I'd say. Copy off the notch as well, and proceed to also mark the waistline, pocket slant, and the top notch. This one will be the blind, also referred to as the big facing, and I worry that I'll get tired of saying that this is bespoke clothing that you're making so they can be whatever shape or dimensions you want, but for now I'm marking a point 4 centimeters down from the bottom notch, and then I'm adding 6 centimeters on behind the slanted pocket line. Copy off the waistline and its inlay again, copy off the notches and copy off the slant and a few centimeters down below the waistline again. Right, take away the pattern to measure down one less centimeter than you did for the blind. It's not totally necessary to do one less centimeter, but this way the seams won't be sitting on top of one another. The same idea is employed adding only five centimeters behind the slanted line. But you also need to add a centimeter in front of the slanted line this time. Having cut them out, you'll do well to mark the notches and then the slanted pocket line on the blind, being sure to mark the wrong sides. For the side adjusters, I just have the pattern we made in the waistband video. Well, not the same one, my normal one, but my point stands. We can trace it off long side with the grain, 
marking the wrong sides and splitting them into their two pieces. Now we're done with our front trouser fabric, we're moving on to sleesha. You need it doubled like normal, and then fold it over for our pocket bag. What I'm doing is measuring up about how much space my pocket is going to take up so that I can fold the fabric in an economical manner. I'm checking the width of the trouser from 2.5cm past the centre front line and adding 3cm as well. That's about how much I want it folded over. Then I know the height of my pocket, so I mark that on too. Mine is 33 centimeters here, but I think that 40 centimeters would have been a much better height. Lay your trouser onto that fabric and maneuver it until the fold of the sleesha comes to where you want it. Usually though, the top of the pocket is at the same point as the crease, and the bottom is 2.54 centimeters past the crease. The bottom of the sleesha being at least 37 centimeters below the inlay. Trace around the trouser, trace off the notches and pocket line, and chalk on the waistline. Remove the trouser and mark down the amount that you added to the bottom of the blind plus at least a centimetre, assuming a half centimetre French seam, from the bottom notch. So I'll do four centimetres. From there you can draw the shape you want your pocket to be. From that same point draw the inlay three centimetres out from the side seam edge all the way up to the waistband inlay. You could cut it out at this point, and then add a centimetre seam allowance to the slant and draw a horizontal line out from the notch. Make sure that you unfold it so that we only cut away one side, giving us an asymmetrical shape. To cut out your back pockets, 19 centimeters by 30 centimeters. Simple enough, but this time I wanted to try curved edges. For the same reason, I decided to taper the top of the pocket as well. At this point, you could also cut the silicia for the fly and fly guard. You only need one of each, but for the guard, it needs to more than eclipse the fabric. Lay the fly onto the silicia with the grains parallel and copy off the outer curve, the one without the notch, without. Extend it a bit above the top and bottom and take away the fly. Measure into the proverbial fly by three or four centimeters all along the curved line and cut that piece out. Doing it this way is just more economical than cutting silicia on the bias.
Now is also good for cutting the curtain and waistband lining. These can be silicia or lining, though I think it's a bad idea to make the waistband lining from lining and requires an extra step when attaching it. So hold fast on that for now, methinks. For the width of the curtain, it's double the height you want, plus two centimeters. I've chosen 14 centimeters plus two, five and three quarter inches. I'd suggest cutting it on the fold of the fabric because it's mostly used as one long piece and we can take what we want from it. Though, we, though what we need is the waist measurement plus 20 centimeters for inlay, but you'll see. The waistband linings are the same dimensions as the waistband. If you use a consistent silicia, then I suggest that, that you keep safe what you don't use on this trouser, because the small bits of it we need and can use later on. There's also this other bit which strengthens the fork, the crotch guard. Like, we've all had a pair of trousers split open on us, well, here's the preventative measure that you'd want on a thousand pound pair of trousers. This is Silesia, make sure it's doubled up. Cut two squares, parallel and or perpendicular, same thing, to the grain, about 15 by 15 centimeters. Yeah, mine is 10 by 10, 15 by 15 is a better size. Plus, if we had plinking shears, we could cut a triangle away from one of the edges. That would be better, but I don't have a pet. You'll have two pieces of fabric which you should iron in half and or along the long side across the bias, creating triangles. We need to curve the folded edge. Wet it. Use a steaming iron and pull it, stretching the edge. Try to shrink the silicia towards the point by pulling the point and steamily pulling the point perpendicular away from the iron rocking them back and forth, moving to the point. Take your front trouser and place the point onto the triangle. Be sure that the top resides below the zip notch, or at least a centimeter above it. Cut it out following the edge of the fork. Real quick, you need to make your trouser appropriate for the pocket that you want. Add the one centimeter seam allowance to the slant and cut along that. You could do this at any point after finishing the pocket bits, but then I thought, now's good. We want to steam the lining thoroughly to make it shrink and discolor as much as possible before putting it in the trouser. On doubled up lining material, lay the front trouser on the lining in the most economical way possible, with the selvage being around 15 centimeters about five inches coming from a trouser maker I intern slash interned with below the knee line. If it's stuck a little bit above, that's fine, but five inches is good. I'm we're using the selvage because it is the least bulky way of making sure it doesn't fray. Cut it out roughly with at least a few centimeters on each side while cutting it flush along this top so that we know where to line it up. We only need to take down the details, and only as much as it would be helpful. Hence, on the balance points, you might like to mark just one stitch at least a centimetre right away from the seam. Down the centre front, and most other straight lines, it could be very wide. To be fair, there's no such thing as too dense, but at some point you're just getting diminishing returns and wasting time.
Notably, at the waistband it's an important seam. On the front, we want to mark about a centimeter from the front edge, and on the inlay, in the center back, do a mark stitch. At the seat seam, we'd want it more dense, really anywhere there's a curve it should be more dense, and less so where it's just straight. I suggest mark stitch on the side and inseam, right where it begins to flare, so that you know where we need to begin to start flaring at the hem. For the darts, we could just cut notches on either side at the top and do a single mark at the bottom, with the top of the stitch being at the exact bottom of the dart. If we do this every time, we'll, we will be able to really stop thinking about it. Mark the top and bottom notches of the pocket, though really we could just snip into it, that's probably better. Cutting the patterns into two is a difficult process, and when you're cutting the threads loose, do be sure that you can see the whole of your trouser, otherwise you may have to start again with fresh fabric. Be aware of where other uncut threads are because you may pull those out without noticing while trying to cut some others. If it happens though, just pull out that whole bit of thread and redo it. A couple of things that can make this easier for you is to use a thicker basting thread and to have a greater amount of thread between each stitch. By the time You've done it several times, it becomes quite easy, even though it feels like hours the first few times. We're going to base the lining and crotch guard to the front trouser. Since the lining is cut larger than the trouser, with one side line one edge as flush as possible and the top flush as we cut it. Start with basting on the top, starting on the flusher side, creating fullness in the lining along the top by pulling a small amount of the lining towards each previous stitch. We can't have the lining being tight. Baste quite close to the edge of the trouser fabric, keeping your hand underneath. Then go back to where we started and baste down the flush-ish edge. If it's the front edge, then make sure you put on the crotch guard. However, with regard to the crotch guard, I think it might be easier to baste it on separately after we've basted it on and trimmed the lining. However, we could also baste it on first and baste it on underneath the lining, but I don't know, maybe I'd just like to see it. For the second side, we need to give the lining a small hill's worth of extra fabric. Still basting close to the edge, from the front trouser. There is a hairline sweet spot. We can't have too much, but too little is any less than a hair's less than too much. If we do have too little, short term it could shrink and we'll end up with a smaller trouser. Longer term it could tear. 
It comes with experience and really much more easily if you have someone with experience to critique you in the moment. Oversimplified, if it's the correct amount, we should be able to brush the lining with our hand to distribute ease, the ease to the point that it almost disappears. Too much and the lining will just pleat too easily. You'd overlock the three things together. I would say that you're unlikely to have an overlocker though. Hence, if your machine has a zigzag function, use that. If your machine doesn't have that function, you will be okay just to use a normal stitch to hold everything together, less than half a centimeter from the edge. If you don't have an overlocker, but you do have a lot of time on your hands, then you could blanket stitch all the way around. I don't even have the patience to zigzag around all the way, to be honest. We would overlock with all the pieces right side up for every run of overlocking. We also wouldn't overlock across the bottom, along the hem at this point, until we put the front and back together, so we would do it before we put up the hem. If you have none of the above, just make sure your basting stitch is secure. Should your front trouser feature a dart, do it before you put on the lining. Normally though, remove the basting, excess threads, stitching, and press the perimeter. I can't do what I normally do to create the centre front crease because domestic irons don't have a strong forceful jet of steam button. So I'm just going to adapt it slightly. I'm starting with pushing the excess lining fabric towards the sides away from the centre front. Usually though I'm using the strong jets of steam to just press the excess down. It does look very wrinkled that way. I'm folding the trouser gently in half along the crease to be, preserving where I, where I put the lining. The crease usually starts a little above the bottom of the seat seam, so we can just start there. Feel through the fabric and make sure the lining is clean under there. Place the iron onto the fold and begin to create our crease. Ordinarily I'd be pressing the entire width of the trouser, but the lining is dense at the edge and would crease significantly, so I won't here in this case. As I begin to move 
onto the next section of the fold to crease. Again, I'm feeling through and gently forcing and rubbing my hand through the fabric to the lining, making sure it's flat under there. As we get below the lining, it's easy just to press it flat. There's nothing there under there to complicate it. Check that your crease is sharp enough to pass the paper test, and also check the lining side. We want a single good crease in the lining as well. If the lining is creased or pleated anywhere else, then just iron those out. Lay the facing blinds wrong side down onto the bags. Be sure you make mirror images between the two lots of three pieces, making sure you know which side is which for the blinded facing, i.e. the facing lines up flush to the edge of the pocketing with the notches on the slanted seam, while the blind or big facing sits three centimeters behind the other edge of the pocket. I'm one centimeter under on the blind and facing for securing them in place. You might prefer to chalk the one centimeter beforehand though. To fell the small facing in place, line up the notches of the facing in the pocket bag, lining it up to the correct edge. Doing both at the same time, making sure you always have mirror images. Just baste along the folded edge in order to fell them. I want to give my pocket a pocket within a pocket, a coin pocket, this time, so I'm taking a piece of Silesia 11.5 by 13 centimeters. I'm folding in the two 11.5 centimeter edges over half a centimeter and ironing them. The 13 centimeter edges, I'm ironing them also half a centimeter over, then one of the sides I'm ironing over again to hide the seam. I need to top stitch this edge. I'm going to top stitch near the fold around half a centimeter from the edge rather than at the very edge of the square we made. Then I'm going to place it onto the sleecha, usually onto the right pocket bag, but I accidentally put it on the left. So usually I'd put one in both. It needs to be on the blind slash big facing side. It needs to be at least a centimeter of the bottom and not infringing on where the big facing is going to be. We might like to angle the pocket slightly so that the opening is facing the pocket slant more. To begin attaching the facing on the lower edge, we should leave one or one and a half centimeters not sewn on the non-sewn side towards the pocket opening. This will help us out later. The felling kind of takes forever, but well, not anymore for me, but still. You could machine them down, which I covered in the slanted pocket video, or even just top stitch on top of the folded edges. I like the hand sewn details though. To fix the coin pocket within my pocket, we're edge stitching around the perimeter. I'm starting with a stitch right on the edge of my sleesha. 
over the three sides, obviously not closing the opening. So I am also going to do a stitch a little more than, a little less than half a centimeter from the edge in order to hide the exposed seam inside of the pocket, essentially French seaming it. Should have checked that the pocket didn't encroach on the big facing before I machined it down, so I guess I got lucky. Cut the linen for the back of the fly and fly guard, just place them onto some linen and cut around them as close as possible. Put the linen on the wrong side of their appropriate pieces. Machine them along the gentle curve, the one with the notch, with a less than half centimeter seam allowance. Linen side up both times. Trim the linen exactly around the pieces if it's sticking out a little bit at this point. For the fly, attach the fly piece to the curved edge right side to right side, with a little extra at the top and bottom to sew them together with a half centimetre seam allowance. Then you want to attach the fly guard to its lining right side to right side with a whole centimetre seam allowance. On the fly, iron the tape over and then back over the fly. You also need to have pressed the fly guard inside out, except such that the trouser fabric is superimposed onto the lining side by a few millimeters. A convenient way of doing this is linen side up, 
fold the seam allowance over with a stitch on the edge or a bit over the linen, ironing it as we go. When we turn it out, there will already be a crease exactly where we want it. Cement the crease with another press. Then you need to sink stitch between the fly and its silicia from the front of the fly. We can prick stitch it to be more precise and couture or machine it, which usually requires me to put my head between the camera and the needle, so you can forgive me if it goes a bit wonky. First thing you need to do is extend the darts up into the inlay. I suggest at this point only chalking on the wrong side except for the pocket opening. Technically these are clems rather than darts. A dart is one that opens and closes, a clem is more open-ended. When taking the dart up into the inlay though, it should be tapered inwards at a commensia rate to the dart bit of the dart. As I mentioned earlier, we can create we can cut small notches in the tops of the dart on the top of the inlay so that we can see them from both sides, making it easier to fold over. When you fold the dart over, you can baste and iron it down. Don't baste on the dart line though, just next to it if that's what you choose to do. When machining the dart, we can start from the top and then just machine down the chalk line. As we near the bottom of the dart, we want to make it very slim. We don't want to curve into it as we get to the bottom. When we get to the bottom of the dart, keep machining off of the fabric that'll quickly and easily secure the thread. One of probably dozens of ways of doing darts, not all of them wrong. We've done double welted pockets before, so I kind of don't need to do it again, but I think it could be useful. On the inside of the trouser, at the edges of the pocket opening, you should use two small squares of fusing. This will inhibit, if not completely retard, the chevrons from fraying, resulting in sharper corners, which is, you know, a good pocket. Baste some 5 by 19 cm linen over the pocket opening evenly on all sides. Line up the first pocket bag up to the top of the inlay, at the very top of the trouser fabric, and make sure it runs parallel to the dart and you could pin it in place before basting a little above and below the pocket opening. Then get the jets up too. Line the first jet evenly onto the pocket opening, measuring that you have the same amount of jet on each side. Copy off each side of the pocket opening onto the first jet. Line the second jet up to the first, basting it down, and chalking, chalking on each side of the pocket opening again, which I forgot to do on camera. I want the bastes holding each of the jets in place to be very secure, so that the fabric 
by extension the chalk marks, will move as little as possible in the machine. To sew them down, I want to reiterate that getting the start and end point parallel is important. Don't stitch more than half a centimeter from the pocket opening. We really want the two to be half one centimeter apart. One centimeter apart. Having used a sharp piece of chalk will make getting them parallel easier. You'll see more clearly exactly where to start and end. If the machine pushes and stretches a jet, you could have basted it more thoroughly, or you could just half ignore the chalk mark. Just make sure that the stitches end and start in line with each other. And make sure that the bottom of the sleesha is out of the way, which I bring up for no particular reason. Give the stitches a press, remove all the basting so far. Cut the pocket hole, be sure to cut the chevrons, something that the fusing is making much easier. Should you wish, I'd bet longer chevrons would make the next steps easier. Just a thought. From the back, without folding the jets through, we can press open the seam allowances. If you have cloth soap, we can brush some onto the po pocket opening onto the back before folding it open. The seam allowance is split where the jet fabric meets the trouser fabric. I'm folding up the silicia, the linen, and trouser. Press them both open and pull the mitres out as well. We can use a wooden block if we want and use it to press on what we've ironed. It'll absorb the remaining moisture and help the creases set. We'll baste the jets in place. Fold the jets to the inside of the trouser if not already. Fold the jets down over their seam allowances. If it was done precisely, the seam allowance should be 5mm. We want the two welts to meet in the middle without gaping or overlapping. Then baste them in place along the welt, not on the trouser, only basting through the welt. Base the welts together such that they won't move laterally, making sewing the chevrons easier in a bit.
Give it a quick pre-iron, and while it's out, I'm ironing the lower jet under itself one centimeter. Fold the trouser and the silicia either above or below the pocket out of the way, exposing only the welt. We need to machine the welt to the seam that was ironed down earlier. There's only half a centimeter to sew to, but we should get as close to the first stitch as we did as possible without sewing over it. Back tack both sides slightly before and after the seam allowance starts and finishes. Sew the top and bottom welts. Then for the chevrons, fold them to the reverse, if not already, and pull the end, moving the trouser and silicia out of the way. Hold the ends of the two welts together, making sure they're flat there. You might like to do a preliminary stitch across the jets to keep them together. Pulling the mitre taut, stitch exactly across where it's cut to, between the two lines of stitching right where they end. Go back and forth over them, and if you're confident and you don't think you'll need to redo it, then angle the stitching to stitch towards the top of the pyramid, and then straighten out and do more stitches like the first few. Iron the jets to make them more crispy wispy, and at the same time iron the lower welt up so such that you can fell it in place if not done already. Line up the bearer to the other pocket piece, either making them even or offset the bearer relative to the lower jet by a centimeter, and sew it in place one way or the other. On account of having a whole trouser, I absolutely did baste my pocket bags together before machining them, folding the trouser up and out of the way and the bearer facing outwards. Sew the perimeter with a half centimeter seam allowance.
I trimmed away the little bits of excess, flipped the pocket inside out, pulled the stitching right to the edge and ironed it. And I just think it looks very satisfying like this. Do another line of stitching, half a centimetre seam allowance to French the pocket closed. Along the top, above the welt, make a seam closing the top of the pocket, which incidentally also seals any tabs or flaps up there. Iron and inspect your seams, and if they're good, we're good to go. Prepare your waistbands with the appropriate amount of band roll canvas. The appropriate amount is the same length as the waistband. We should start with making sure we put the correct sides together to sew them together correctly. If we place the fabric wrong side up, we need to place the band roll canvas such that the bias tape on the edge is sitting on top of the heavy waistband canvas. I'm pinning them together so that I don't lose it. I'm not bothering to chalk, I'm just going to hold them together so that the selvage is about one centimetre from the edge of the canvas. When you sew them together, sew about half a centimetre from the edge of the waistband canvas. Don't bother back tacking it all, and as we're machining, hold the waistband taut to the effect of not allowing the fabric to be pulled by the zip feet, creating unwanted ease. In the same sense, I'm doing it section by section that I can hold down on the tiny amount of table I have with my machine. Iron the seam. Iron the waistband taut over the canvas. Hold the fabric tightly as you push the canvas into the fabric and iron the crease. To make it very clean, smooth and flat, lay it fabric side down first. Lay your hand onto the fabric and push the canvas into it. Use your iron as a weight to press it flat there and do the same all along the waistband. Then we can baste or overlock the bias tape, trimming away any fabric beyond the tape. We could instead use a tailor's soap on the canvas and then on the bias tape to then iron them using the weight of the iron to hold the fabric in place while we pull the fabric vertically downwards, sticking it to the waistband. While the soap is holding the fabric to the waistband, we'll give it a stitch down the middle of the bias tape. We want to check about halfway through that the fabric isn't being pulled. And if it is, or regardless, I usually do it anyway, hold the very ends together to make sure that it doesn't pull any more. Check that the waistband is acceptable, 
that it hasn't pulled too much, and we'll move on. For some reason, I keep managing to curve the heavy canvas, so I'm trying to straighten it a little. Now yeah, that'll be fine. Step 1A is attaching the zip to the front of the right trouser. Line up the zip top side down to the notch and or mark we made and baste it in place. When we place it down, we need to place the bottom stop of the zip a small amount above the notch. Align the fly guard lining up the notches right side to right side with the zip in between, moving its lining or leash out of the way. Baste it or not, but know where the notches are and make sure they're aligned. Step 1A is attaching the fly to the left trouser. Lay them right side to right side or correct side to the correct side. Align their notches and pin or baste it in place. Or not, whatever. With the right trouser with the bearer, sew the three together with a one half centimeter seam allowance. Sew them together from the notch with the lining facing up. Chalking the notch on clearly would help. We might need to move the zip head out of the way, but we can just sew out of the top of the trouser. Machine the fly and the left trouser together with a one whole centimeter seam allowance. Or, I would suggest you try and make a small centimeter seam allowance. So, if you can make a consistent 7 or 8 millimeter seam, that might be better. It will become a centimeter seam when we fold the fly over. Start right on the notch with the linen up this time. Once again, we can sew off with the top of the trouser. Remove the basting, give the seams a press. Cut the notch to the stitching and trim away half of the fly seam all the way up. Iron the seam towards the trouser from above the notch. Fold the seam over such that the seam is on the inside of the trouser, which should be easy given the combination of how we cut and ironed the seam allowance. Holding in position, i.e. with the seam about 1mm from the edge, baste it in place to a little above the notch. If you're happy with it, if you're happy with it, press the seam to give it a solid crease to hold it in place. For the zip, again, get rid of the basting and press the seam flat. From the notch, roll the trouser towards the zip teeth and baste it down a millimeter or so from there, such that the zip still works moving the sleeve behind it out of the way so that you aren't catching it at all here. testing that the zip does still work. Cut through the front fabric at the notch, only cut through the front fabric, cut to where it's folded on the zip. This is a different way of attaching the pocket than my other video, might be easier and specifically better when we have patterned fabric. First order of business is to attach the pocket and the facing to the pocket opening. Especially if we overlocked it, we can snip into the pieces again to make the notches clearer. As an aside, we do both fronts in tandem, always going to the machine with both pieces at the same time and such like. 
It's just easier to film with one pocket on the board than later one on the machine. Take the facing, which will be attached to the silicia, and place it to the correct side, the outside of the appropriate trouser. Line up the notches. There is only one correct way around for each trouser when placing the facing onto the outside. Take a piece of linen 2cm wide and longer than the distance between the notches and place it evenly on them. Line it up to the edge of the pocket piece on the silicia on the outside of the two pieces. We might like to base them first, probably advisable. Give yourself chalk marks at the notches as a guide. Sew them together only between the notches and with another small centimetre seam allowance, 7 or 8 millimetres. Cut down the notches, and you might find yourself with a nicer end result to angle the cut from between the notches. Plus, again, cutting away half the seam of the facing, pocketing, and linen. Iron the seam towards the silicia. Fold the pocket over and be sure that when you secure it, the front is bleeding out to the back. If you want to finish the pocket as you go, don't prick stitch the pocket open yet. I'm just re-ironing my centimeter seam allowance on the blind, making sure it's crisply folded over. Should your fabric feature a pattern, that should already be close. But lay the front trouser atop the blind in order to make it perfect. This is why we mark stitch the pocket line in the notches. So line up the pocket line on the blind up to the pocket line that we've made on the trouser. Pin them together, flip it over, and fold the sleesha back over onto its other half, and pin the blind only to the sleesha. Remove the original pin so that you can maneuver the blind and its pocket piece and attach it. Remembering at the bottom that we're leaving a centimeter unstitched on the raw side. At this point, we'll French the pocket. I'd be insulting your intelligence at this point to narrate it, but I'd be remiss if I didn't show it. Or maybe I'm just too lazy to narrate it.
Now we need to be able to move the pocket bag away in order to sew the front trouser and the blind together in order to later sew the front and back trousers together. This is why we left the centimetre or so unsewn. Only cutting through the silesia that is between the front trouser and the blind, cut the silesia to about level, if a little below the blind, and one centimetre behind the raw edge of the blind. We need to stitch the blind and the front trousers together. Sewing at an angle towards the bottom of the pocket and turning back will prevent it from showing in the front at the side seam at all, and will show us the point that needs to be sewn over when we attach the back trouser. I also suggest strengthening the bond by just going back and forth with it on the machine a little bit halfway over the seam allowance as well. To fix the trouser front to the blind at the top of the pocket opening, make sure you know where it's going. Have the pocket opening flat on the blind and carry on the pocket line upwards. You also need to make the commensurate mark on the front trouser. We can iron the mark into it, folding it over such that it is lined up with the chalk marking and press a crease into it. There are bits of fabric and silesia up there. The facing and the half of the pocket that's attached to the facing. We can just cut away a centimetre or so, or the seam above the top of the pocket. This way, the seam sits much flatter. Move the silesia behind the big facing out of the way. Get them lined up together and pin the seam in place. First, pin it parallel to the crease to fold it back to see whether it's in about the right place before pinning it perpendicular to the crease to machine it down. Only those two layers though. Keep the pocket behind it out of the way. Back tack on both sides, follow the crease, and end, once again, at the notch. If you've found yourself having sewn it in the wrong place, you might be able to try again before you take out the previous stitches. And if you are behind where you were supposed to be, you might not have to take them out at all. And this is the earliest point that if you wanted to prick stitch the pocket opening that you could do it. This is an alternative method for making the side tab adjusters that I think might be slightly superior.
Fold them in half and sew the ends with a half centimeter seam allowance. We might like to trim a triangle of the fabric beyond the stitching on the folded edge so that it'll sit nicer when we fold it out. We are ironing that seam open. Flip it out and gently push it into a point, making the point symmetrical and ironing it down like that. With the seam we made on the outside, fold it in half again to machine the long edge with a half centimeter seam allowance. Do the same for both and with the long tab we also need to machine the small side with the seam allowance in the middle of the tab, folding the seam allowance open and machining that a little bit back and forth with a half centimeter seam allowance. Press the whole seam allowances open, flattening the tabs gently into arrows. We could brush them with a bit of Taylor's soap here just before we turn them out to hold the tabs flatter later. We can use a knitting needle, or in my case a chopstick, to flip the tabs out, but whatever you can do to achieve the same effect. We could have cut away a little bit of the seam allowance in the corner of the long tab, but apparently I forgot. Though we can still use the chopstick to massage rather than push or force the corners out giving us good strong right angles. Final iron, manipulate the tabs into as symmetrical arrows as is efficient and give them a press in place. Once we're happy that all four of our pieces are quite similar, we can put them into our Ziploc bag with the buckles. I don't know if I mentioned already, don't think I did, but a tailor recently told me, more of a saying, but a well-made garment shouldn't need to be pressed. Just meaning that as we make, we should be pressing it before and after we use a piece. It gives the presser, or us, whoever, less work when doing the final press. Lay the back and front trouser inside to inside and line the edge of the front trouser up to the mark stitched edge of the back trouser, ignoring the sleeve. Line up the waistline, construction line and seat line, and the knee and hemline. We want to chalk those points onto the inlay so that we can see them and the front legs marks at the same time. 
They may not line up perfectly, and I'm not entirely sure why, but it's most important to line up the waistlines. Everything else is secondary. Baste in place, baste closely to the one centimeter seam allowance, but not on it. Moving the pocket bag out of the way, basting through the blind or big facing. What we need to remember is the flare we gave to the bottom of the hem. If you did it the way I suggested, there's the last mark stitch before it flares, but I guess we can see in the way that we cut it. Machine the two together. We like these starting from the top with one and the bottom with the other. Regardless, when you get to the border of the blind and the rest of the tr front trouser, it's quite bulky, so be conscious that it'll try to push you away from the one centimeter seam allowance that we want. Making sure that we have the one centimeter seam allowance, the pocket will end in the side seam, as all trousers should. Don't back tack at the top or the bottom of the trouser. Remove the basting here and iron the machining flat. Then we need to check that yes, the bottom of the pocket ends in the side seam and there aren't any raw edges showing. We should press the seam open. We basically need to iron the flare separately because it doesn't sit flat with the rest of the seam. Similar to the point that the blind meets the front, we might like to put it on an edge board or plank of wood. Due to the unwieldy seam, it might be, take a bit of oomph to press it down flat and make it stay that way. While you're at it, iron a 1cm seam at the ed end of the pocket inlay. You could base the lower half of it to the inlay, but don't fell them. Especially at the bottom of the pocket with the cumbersome seams, make sure that the stitch line is fully pressed open. I'd do the bar tacks and prick stitching at the ends of the pocket now, such that they're hidden underneath the pocket bag, but I didn't, saving it for finishing. First thing I want to do is mark on 3 and 4 centimeters from one edge of each waistband, making sure that the marks are mirrored. 3 centimeters is the inlay I put onto the trouser, and the extra 1 centimeter is the seam allowance. Next, chalk the waistline onto the trouser, allowing it to curve with the top of the inlay. Same for the rise inlay too, if you've forgotten or lost your mark stitches, I put 3cm at the top. From the 4cm point on your waistband, measure half the waist measurement and mark that on as well. 
We mark that point so that we know where both ends of the trouser are going to be on the waistband. I also want to check the length of the waistline on the trouser. From the inlay mark, we should get a measurement of about half the waist plus one centimeter for the seam allowance and two and a half centimeters at these. The same amount extra that we had when we drafted the pattern and checked the waist measurement the first time. On the bearer side, mark the waistline and the inlay. And on the bearer, we should mark it as a slightly downward incline so that the waistband doesn't show over the front. We should cut the silesia down to one centimeter below the waistline here. We should cut the stitching holding the silesia so that it can sit one centimeter below the waistline. Mark seven millimeters into the trouser from where the fabric is attached to the zip because this is where we'll overlap the fly side onto. Again, measure the waistline from there to the inlay for the same basic check. Line up the three centimeter mark on the waistband to the inlay on the inlay mark we chalked on the lining, while the bias canvas edge of the waistband lined up to the mark stitches. Start basting it down near the heavy canvas but on the bias tape. As stated, the waistband on the trouser being a little more than we want, we will ease in the extra fabric as we baste it to the waistband, where we marked the correct slash finished waist measurement. It does depend on the amount you can physically put in, and you might need to reduce the starter size of the trouser depending on the material. To ease in the fabric, we need to pull the waistband, causing a small amount of rumpling in the trouser. This way we can line the front mark on the trouser up to the second mark on the waistband. The end result will be that the trouser has the waist measurement. Now it didn't take me half a minute to understand what that whole bit was, so give it a, so give it a bit of thought. As you do it more and more it will become clearer. It definitely took me a few pairs of trousers and a couple of jackets as well before I understood what was going on. You might like to use a pin at our endpoint so that we know how much ease there is to put in. Importantly, be sure to move the top of the back pocket out of the way. For the front pocket, you'll base through the blind, but none of the silesia. Make sure the seam allowances and the darts are basted down as they're supposed to sit and based securely so that they won't, move, won't be moved by the machine. We want to put most of the extra fabric into the back and side because that's where most people need the extra fabric, being more flat around the front. Do similar on the fly side with the same but mirrored points marked on the waistband. Line up the first to the inlay and then the waist measurement plus one centimeter to the very front edge. We are basting through the fly as well. To reiterate, on the fly guard you need to unpick the sleesha to below the waistline. You need half the zip out of the way and you definitely need at least a centimetre of waistband left past the guard, which is why we added all 16 centimetres of inlay to the waistband. That said, if it does come up short, so long as the other end goes past the seam allowance on the back, it will be okay to reduce the amount of inlay we have. Baste it a second time if there's a lot of ease so that it's better distributed. It'll be easier to iron in and less likely to create pleats and kinks. To the same effect, wet steam and press the fabric to try and shrink the fabric to make it easier to sew in general. We're sewing along the point that the bias tape meets the canvas, which is the same as a one centimeter seam allowance. And for best results, don't catch the heavy canvas at all. When machining them, you still don't want to catch any silesia, hence it has to be done in two parts. With the bearer side, we might want to start from the center back, while the fly side, we might want to start from the center front. We want to machine along the back onto the blind and stopping where the blind meets the front part. Back tack and flip the pocket towards the back, starting exactly where next to where you finished, making sure the seam allowance there is open, back tacking again and continuing to the zip and all center front or vice versa, kind of.
When sewing the right trouser, should your zip teeth go up above the waistline, slow down and maybe use the wheel to move the needle when going over the teeth. Otherwise, you may very well slam a needle into a solid metal nugget, and that doesn't tend to go well. Proceed all the way across the bearer, folding out the seam allowance to sew slightly onto it and don't back tack. On the left trouser, sewing over the fly, still no need to back tack. Check the trousers, make sure nothing is nipped anywhere, accidentally put in any tiny accidental bleeds. Something I think the Italians do because it traps significantly more ease, giving them greater comfort on the whole. But come on man, let's try and keep it clean. If you did get a small pleat, take out the small amount of stitching either side and try to shrink the fabric with steam and our iron before replacing the stitching. Press the seam and take out the basting. We need to split the side seam down to the waist stitch because the front trousers inlay is going to be ironed up with the front pocket and the back inlay will just be ironed down. And definitely split the stitch down to the waistline, not the fabric. Press the seam on the back trouser open and iron the front trousers inlay upwards. If you wanted a fob pocket for your oyster card or some such, as shown in the waistband video, then yes, we do need to cut down the appropriate width of inlay in order to sew it on. To put on the side adjusters, establish where you want them. Usually the center of the buckle is in line with the side seam of the trouser, and then decide how high you want it. We can trim away any loose threads if needs be. Base them in place, it don't need to be pretty, with the long adjuster pointing backwards and about halfway through the buckle as standard. Basically do both tabs in the same way, but making sure that the tab that holds the buckle in place the thin part is secured under the arrow part. Basically do both halves of the tab in the same way, but making sure that the tab that holds the buckle in place, the thin part is secured under the arrow part. Once set, I'm chalking a line to follow with a prick stitch cross so that I know on both sides where I want to stop felling. Unlatch the long adjuster from the buckle so that you can get at it. Set the adjusters in place as you please, either fell or prick stitch them in place, or both. 
Make sure that it's safe and strong at the point that both sides stop being attached to the waistband as those might be under the most amount of stress. Alternatively to prick stitching normally across the tabs, we can stitch from the back, the waistband side. Maybe more of a running stitch, we can stitch such that we catch the bottom of the non-showing half of tabs. This way, we don't have a line of pricks along the tab. I don't know, just thought I'd put that out there. Really, it doesn't take me that long anymore, and enough practice and techniques won't take more than 20 minutes to do all four of them. We can just remove the basting when we're done. Align the front leg up to the back leg's inlay. You need to line the front part again up to the mark stitches and line up the balance points. Again, they might, and again, they might not be properly aligned, and I've no idea why. But it's important that we line up the seams up at the seat in the front trouser up to the mark stitches. Base them in place and machine it. You know the drill. Basically the same as the other time except simpler, still flaring out at the bottom. Don't bother back tacking at the bottom, but do back tack at the top of the leg. Iron it flat of course, removing the basting and ironing the seam open. Ideally with a sleeve board, but plank of wood works fine too. Flip the trouser outside out and lay it with the front center line as the fold because it's about time to iron it flat. We should already have a front crease so make sure that's flat and that the trouser is flat to create the back crease. Start on the front and making sure the fabric is flat underneath and all the way between the front and back that we're working on. Pull the fabric back towards where the back trouser wants to fold, but keep the front flat as we put pressure on it with the iron too, like using a weight, a sleeve board base, or something to keep the center front crease in position, like a plank of wood because the crease is kind of hot. Get it nice and flat up to and around the bottom of the rise. If flat isn't doable at the rise under the seat, then just try and make both legs even. Once the trouser is flat, which is much more easily said than done, I think, the trouser should be shaped, but for now I'm leaving that out. 
though if you want to stretch the fabric at the thigh and calf and shrink it at the hammies and the shin, yeah, go for it. Some other time I'll detail this in this better in another video. Firstly, a final check that the waistbands are the correct length. I'm starting from the centre back and measuring to the 7mm mark that we made by next to the bearer. I'm marking the 1cm on for the seam allowances. I'm applying that measurement to the second trouser to save doing the addition. If it's a little off, then we can alter it from the centre back. Mine is a little off, likely because I'm measuring over the tabs but I am reducing the waist by one centimeter, moving the center back line by half a centimeter each. On the fly side, the right trouser On the fly side, the right trouser, on the inside, chalk the line that we'll machine so that it's clear. One centimeter from the mark stitches and then one centimeter from the fabric. Follow the seam up into the waistband. I did both, but I'm an idiot. We only need to do the one on top, which will be the fly. Push the inlay on the inseam such that the top edge follows the rest of the trouser. That way it has ease and won't become tight. And I'm chalking one centimeter on that like the trouser before and after. Flip the fly side inside out, trust me it's easier to do it this specific way around, and place the guard side right way out inside of it. Line up the centre back, the notch, at the bottom of the zip, and everything in between. Be sure that the mark stitch lines are lined up, not just the raw edges of the inlay. The inside leg seam and the other balance points. The inside leg doesn't necessarily need to line up because some trousers have dress. This is for guys and their little guys. One trouser leg is slightly bigger so that the cock and balls can hang or sit more comfortably. Securely base the two in place. When you get to the trouser leg inlay, again, be sure that they won't pull. So push them down a little bit. And be sure too that the waistband seams and stuff are open. Also through the waistband, I'd venture that the waistband is the most important part to get even and lined up properly. Second most important, to get right after the notch.
On the outside, we want the fly side to overlap the guard side. That should happen by default if we line up the fabric at the notch up exactly, and sew it with a 1cm seam allowance. However, with the fly side on top as we sew, we can confirm that the notch we cut into the guard side is beyond the cut in the fly. Not sure whether you can see that though. Start at the notch. We're only sewing through the trouser fabric, not the zip tape or the fly or fly guard. You may favour to use the wheel to stick the needle in the notch. Start at the notch and back tack and all that fun stuff. As you get to the back trouser, you are following one centimetre from the mark stitch, not the inlay. This is made easier considering we chalked a line to follow. Get all the way up to the top of the waistband. That said, on a couple of my trousers, it's only stitched about halfway through the waistband, which gives it greater flexibility or something. When you've gotten to where you want to be, stick the needle in there and turn the entire trouser around. Sew the entire length that you had just sewn, that way the most vulnerable part of the trouser is less likely to split. Mine isn't quite as on the notch as it should have been, so I just used my silk and did a few back stitches to get it right up there. If you did it right, if you did it correctly, then you won't need to do that. Look at what you've done, make sure it's okay and good. The stitch line is smooth and follows the line we want, and take the basting out. Iron the seam flat and stretch the inlay a bit. Wet and pull, don't stretch the stitch though. Do the same at the fork, but you can stretch the stitching a little bit. Iron the seam open, which again is always easiest on a sleeve board or a ham. Start with doing the zip up and proceeding to position the right trouser in place. It should be a few millimetres at the bottom. 
and then it's overlapping by the 7mm we decided earlier when attaching the waistband. Make sure too that the waistband is lined up. Baste it up so that the whole trouser is closed there. Baste it through as much as you need to. Basting up into the waistband should hold it together more securely for positioning the zip. Then, baste the zip tape to the fly piece. Make sure you're only basting those two together because there's more sewing that needs to be done between them. And make sure that you don't push or pull the zip. Let the zip sit where it wants to on the fly. We can remove the first base to let the zip down to make it easier to fix the tape to the fly. Fell and prick stitch them. Fell from the bottom all the way up the edge of the zip tape and prick stitch about halfway through the tape. Both of these only to the fly. It is possible to machine it. Two stitches in the same places as the hand stitches. Take the basting out. At this point, we should base the fly to the trouser and chalk on the J-stitch line, but I forgot it's in finishing. Close the zip and lay the bearer and its silicia flat inside of the trouser. Chalk the edge of the seam allowance onto the silicia, just feeling through all the way down to the bottom of the fly and bearer. Flare it out a little at the bottom, we might want some of the excess later, but we're not cutting anything yet. On the centre back, force the waistband inlay down a very small amount and sew it in place. Not much more than 5mm I'd say, but it needs to be hidden by the waistband lining later. Tack it to the seam allowance and then fell along the top, being sure that the stitches don't show on the outside of the trouser. We can tack the bottom first to the seam allowances and through the canvas if you can, or would like, without going all the way through to the outside of the trouser. Then just move straight to the top of the waistband edge and tack that too. Fell across the top simply to hold it to stop it from being able to open up. It's already secure, we just don't want there to be a hole that can be fingered. As you get to the centre back, you can just skip through the middle, not exposing the thread, to fell down the other side, to tack the top and skip straight down to the bottom. I'm still using my finishing silk for this. We could remove the basing when we're done. We don't need it anymore. Now we'll just secure the back pocket or back pockets to the waistband. 
be sure it's laying flat against the trouser and you could iron it too. Trim away the top little bits, make sure it resides below the top of the waistband and you'll also cut away different amounts of the layers so that it lays as flat as possible. Easiest done over a tailor's hand. Cross stitch the top of the pocket to the waistband, being sure that you're attaching it to the canvas not going through to the outside. Before you sew it though, make sure that they aren't tight together, that they won't pull or anything, that there's only a tiny amount of slack, I mean, because we don't want it to go the other way where the sleeve sure bunches up under the waistband. Here I made the mistake of cross stitching my front pockets to the waistband now as well. Usually we'd do it later, but it didn't have many ill effects. I'll mention when it should be done. We trimmed down the inlays as well, still layering it. I'm leaving the canvas nearer the front there for now because I seem to know I'm doing something wrong. And not for the last time, I tell you that. I think it's best to keep the outermost piece the tallest and trim down as we get further towards the canvas. This way, the outermost layer is covering all the tiny steps that won't be felt from the outside anyway. It's covered and padded, as it were, from the inside, so we can't really feel it when touching or wearing it, making them the most comfortable. At this point, because I didn't do it in the waistband video, I'll attach a belt loop to the centre back of my trouser. If we wanted belt loops, we'd have already attached the rest of them when we put on the waistband, though we couldn't want put one on the centre back until after we got the two legs together. With our last belt loop then, begin lining it up to the centre back with one raw side about half a centimetre below the waistband, lined up to the waistband with the seam facing the waistband, so we see the clean side. Start with tacking it either side. I'm moving the belt loop out of the way first to moor the thread into the centre back. You may like to cut the corners, cut away the corners of the currently exposed edge. When it's secure on both sides, start with one side, fold the loop down and fell stitch a centimetre straight down. Again, tack it like we do the belt loops. Prick stitch to the other side and tack that one as well. Fell back up to where we started, making sure the exposed seam is hidden under the loop and between our stitching, which is made easier by cutting away the little bit. Secure the thread out of the way inside the trouser. We'd secure the top of the loop in the same way as we do the rest.
First, real quick, with the chalk again, on your back pockets, as appropriate, mark where the dart is on the pocket. To prepare the curtain, iron it in half, outside on the outside. The curtains go underneath the slams pocket bag and over the back pockets. We chalked the dart so you know where you'll put in some bleeds. Start basting it on underneath the slanted pocket, moving towards the back, basting it to the seam allowance of the waistband. We might not want to remove this baste, so you might want to make sure it's secure and doesn't go through the waistband fabric for all to see. Or you could baste it and then cross stitch it too. I'll leave that to you to decide. When you get to the dart, make a pleat that opens towards the back. Only a couple of centimetres deep will do. Always easiest on a ham, we can iron it to make a nice clean pleat. To make the double or box pleat at the centre back of the trouser, you want to make the pleats only as wide as the inlay, facing inwards towards each other, opening on the inside. Iron it and continue basting, making sure to include a fourth pleat at the other dart, and finishing under the other slanted pocket bag. Trim away the curtain so that it fits under the pocket as well. We already ironed the silesia under itself one centimeter, so now we can baste it to the inlay and the curtain as well. This might be easier if we put it over a sleeve board. We need them to lay naturally together so that the pocket won't pull on the inlay or bunch up when it's attached. Once you've got them sitting together, baste the silesia up the inlay. When we get to the curtain, we'll baste the pocket to the curtain and the inlay but we'll avoid basting through the trouser because that'll just make felling it later more troublesome. From under the forward side of the slanted pocket, on the fly guard side, place some curtain under there. As we baste it, if there's enough space, we might include a pleat. Still facing towards the back, but it is very case by case, depending on how big the person is. This time, we can do without. Secure it a little beyond the seam holding the guard. 
Usually, I'd want to move the pocket bag out of the way and only base the waistband seam allowance, just FYI. Upon getting the curtain under the front sides of our front pocket, we need to base the top of the pocket to the curtain for filling later. Only between the curtain and the pocket still don't catch the rest of the trouser. I'm going to set the bearer now. I'm cutting away the excess beyond the line we chalked so that we have a healthy seam allowance so that we can cover our seam. Snipping in at the curve so that I can fold it in a curve. Make sure there's enough bees and the silicia won't pull on the bearer when we connect it to the seam allowance. Fold and iron the silicia on the chalk line such that it will hide the undesirable seam from view. And again with the ham or lack there fucking of. Since I didn't overlock it, I can trim off loose threads on the seam allowance before basting the sleesha to said seam allowance. Ideally, only to the seam allowance, that way it'll be easiest to finish later. When we hit the curtain, basting it to the curtain. For the fly side, fold the end of the curtain inwards one centimeter so that there aren't raw edges on what will be an exposed edge. Baste it to the fly, I suggest so that it's lined up with the edge of the 5mm of the fly's leisure on the side nearer the centre front. If the distance between the fly and the pocket is small, then again we don't need a pleat. Baste it to the seam allowance, and then baste it to the pocket. For finishing the fly and the guard, fold back the waistband such that it is flush with the trouser below it, and iron a crease there so that you know where that is. Unless you want, to, unless you want an extended waistband, then choose how much extra you want beyond the centre front, which is the norm with side adjusters, so that there's two hooks both sharing the increased strain. You may want to trim away the canvas, you'll need to unpick a bit of the top and possibly the bottom depending on your exact method. We could elect to fold it back with the canvas, but that only has any benefit on the fly side. We will fold back and secure the waistband in the same way as we did the centre back. Force it down from the top slightly so that we can hide the raw edge underneath the waistband lining. Tack them on the bottom and the top and fill the raw edge to the waistband so that there's no gaping at all. Trim the inlays layering them a bit again and fold the waistband on top of the inlays and raw edges. No on top. On top! No you fucking idiot! <sighs> Tack them and fill them along the folded bit, except you may not be able to do that on the guard side. Fold it up slightly to the bottom and get that secure. We'll almost always have more leftover waistband on the fly side. We can just cut away the excess so that we have at least two or three centimeters to fold back. I could literally replay the voiceover. Cut down and layer the inlay and fold that excess waistband on top of it, fixing it down in the same way.
Yeah, hook comes under lining, I decided. Depending on the exact type of hook and bar you have will dictate the method of attachment. But with this simple normal one, you need to begin by cutting a strip from your leftover curtain to loop through the hook, which will hold the end of the waistband in a curve. When attaching it, be sure that the hook is on top of the folded back front fabric. Place it a little closer than half a centimeter from the front edge, but not too far either. Otherwise, it's too visible from the outside. To secure it, you will be best using doubled up silk thread because it needs to be really strong. Like I mentioned earlier, if you want to fold back the canvas we can attach the hook before we fold it back. It's much easier that way, I think. For the same reason, you ought to be sure to catch the canvas. Start with one of the front holes and go through that one a few times. Moving on to the other, go under the fabric so that there isn't two centimeters of thread exposed, then moving back to the last one, securing it either side thoroughly. When the hook is set in place, use the strip that you attached and pull on it slightly enough to curve the end of the band. Attach it there to the waistband canvas. We don't need to tack it too far, maybe two or three centimeters from the hook. It doesn't need to be pretty, but it does need to be secure and not visible from the outside of the waistband. We can trim off any excess silicia beyond where we tacked it. When you attach the bar, you need the exact position of where it needs to go to couple with the hook. Do up the zip, make sure the waistbands line up. Chalk both sides of the hook and the vertical tip of it too. We need to make holes just inside of our vertical chalk marks though because we marked the top of the hook, not where we'd like the bar to sit. Now there's this thing called an awl or a bodkin and much the same as zip feet, I don't have one. It's used for making holes in fabric without cutting or breaking it, rather just moving fibers out of the way. In lieu of said tool, we'll have to improvise, easing into it with progressively larger instruments, beginning with a basting needle or the largest needle that you have. You know, it could use a nail. Make the first hole and stick the bar through it. Not the easiest unless your hole is big enough. We can put the bar somewhere and hold it upright and or steady and pull the trouser hole down into it. We might need to use our awl to push the cloth or the canvas fibers a little from either side from the inside in order to get the widest point through. The second side is more of a challenge, and you need to do some acrobatics to get it in there. We need to make the second hole and force the bar further into the first hole before we force it into the second. Do check when you get in place that it's in the right place on both the vertical and the horizontal plane. Use the same thread you used for the hook, sew the bar through both holes to the canvas, still importantly not catching through to the outside fabric. There are no sew hooks and bars that you stab through the fabric and then bend the prongs into a secure position. That will basically go on in the same way. 
Again, we should have done this earlier with the other one, but we're cutting down and layering the seam allowances a little bit. Also, we're giving the bearer its function. I'm cutting the seam allowances from the fly guard down to the waistline. I'm making the cuts about two centimeters apart around the middle of the bearer. On the outside of the bearer, on the waistband seam, chalk either side of where you cut so that we know where we can make a buttonhole later. And back to actually lining the trouser. The waistband lining needs to be turned inwards, one centimeter all the way up and down. Mark, or don't bother, the centimeter across the top and bottom and iron it. Turn in a centimetre on one side so that we can stick into the hook. We can put the lining in in one piece or two. If you want two pieces, then cut them the same length as the waistband. The lining has to be tight into the hook. Push the folded edge into the hook and begin to baste a few centimetres before the hook on the lower side of the waistband, basting up towards the hook. When you get under the hook is when we make sure they're cozied up together. Unfolding the seam allowance a little bit if we need to, moving the baste to the top of the waistband and basting on the lining. Given we don't want it to show, leave a few centimeters above the lining to the top of the waistband. And as you're basting, build in some ease, ensuring that it won't be tight and pull against itself. Hence, make sure it's rolled over your hands. The excess only needs to be as much inlay as there is on the waistband. Any more is just useless. Keep the lining going to the opposite side's inlay. Fold it back to the centre back, then back again along the waistband. If it was two pieces, cut the current waistband flush with the inlay on the opposite trouser. With the other piece of waistband, fold the same amount of lining underneath itself. Line it up to the centre back before beginning to baste it towards the bar to under the guard. When we get to the fly guard seam, we'll usually base the waistband lining underneath the bearer's silesia. Angle the lining to lower its top edge as we get past it so that we don't have to think about it showing. That's the complicated bit. Just base along the bottom edge back to where we started. Nice and easy. We're going to base the guard's silesia down. We should, yeah, should, start from where we unpick the thread to get the waistband on, firstly clearing out any loose machine threads. We need to fold the silesia along the top inwards, cutting some of it away so that we might only have a centimetre to fold down. We can just base them or we can iron them beforehand. Base it across towards the waistband, trying to keep the height level with the waistband lining. We're going to set the bottom of the fly bearer now. Do up the zip and such to position the two comfortably together. 
fold and iron the silesia that extends beyond the fly together. Cut away any excess silesia slightly beyond where the fly and bearer ends to the effect of being able to fold them under the fly. Base it down and make sure it looks alright. For an angled hem, measure from the fork to the front and back. You could use a fork to toe and fork to heel measurement if you have or if you took them. If not, make a horizontal line from the inside leg with the inside leg measurement. On the front, measure 1cm above that, on the back, 1cm below. If, like I said earlier, the inside legs don't line up perfectly, then just measure from the midpoint between them. Join our new points. Do the same to the other leg and make sure that they're identical. It's at this point that I'd overlock along the hem rather than when we first made the legs because now I know where I want the hemline and I can cut, cut it down a little if I wanted to at least five centimeters. Though I'm not sure why I didn't trim the hem so that it's one line all the way around. Fold them up inside along the chalk mark we made and based right along the hem millimeters from where we folded it. Press a crease into where we folded the hem to help it stay there. Obviously having done both legs, fold the trouser inside out. Start with the front. It'll be tight, so stretch the hem with steam and water such that it does lay flat. This is why we flared the bottom of the trouser, and I can honestly tell the benefit of it. And honestly, in watching it again, that was a lot easier than I remember it being. If you can't stretch it enough, then you can trim down the stitching slightly, snipping into the side seam. On the back there will be extra fabric. Hold the hem taut so that you know exactly how much fabric there is. Holding it taut is much easier when you have a sleeve board to place it on and we can just pull the front trouser from underneath. My hand is on the trouser pushing the flank plank of wood up into the back bracing myself against the front. As you can see, the excess fabric around the hem is being drawn towards the trouser leg. Just fold it to one side and iron it, giving yourself an isosceles triangle on the front. Start basting at the bottom of the triangle and baste up and around. The triangle will be felled and then the hem stitched. I'm basting around the leg quite close to the top so that it's easiest to stitch later. I'm trying to keep it taut all the way around and across the front I'm making sure that the ease we stretched out isn't trying to pull downwards again. Apparently after the fact I decide it's a good time to make the raw hem one smooth run, doing it before for my second leg. Upon a successful pair of hems, because we folded the hem up, we need to create the same centre front and centre back creases in the now folded up pieces by ironing them. 
I think we could have guessed. So long as the hem was put up correctly and it's not pulling away from the trouser, it'll be sat snug with the leg and we can crease it neatly. In a lot of ways, the order of finishing doesn't wholly matter so long as it applies the principles that we can hide where we start and end stitches while securing them strongly enough. For now, it's practically a case of felling together all of the lining or silesia, which is basted to some other lining or silesia. However, you really want to start with the curtain and pockets, so that the stitches can be fastened up underneath the waistband lining out of sight. We can take out the basting as and when it becomes redundant if we want, reduces the workload later. Filling the rear side of the pockets, the silesia should already basted, be basted properly, so we just need a neat fell. Start at the bottom, fastening the thread to the inlay, preferably on the horizontal, jutting out from the bottom of the pocket one centimetre or so, filling it across, then up the folded edge. Again, getting to the curtain, still felling it to the trousers inlay if convenient, but no stress if only to the curtain. Fastening under the waistband out of sight. Felling the curtain to the fly is still the very simple case of fastening the thread unobtrusively at the bottom and felling the folded edge of the curtain to the silesia of the fly, still fastening out of mind under the waistband. We should start the waistband near the hook on the bottom, fastening the thread and make headway towards the first corner of the side nestled in the hook. Start filling up the silesia and we can only get a few stitches before we hit the hook. Go under the hook and under the fabric if possible and with the recommended standard hook with the hole make a couple of stitches in there. Under the hook again and fill up the remainder of the silesia. Around the corner and fill all along the waistband. All the way, all the way up the front we're keeping the silesia tight into the cove of said hook. At any point of the finishing of the waistband, we can take out some of the basting in order to move the seam so that we can straighten it, making it more level than maybe it was.
at the center back of the waistband where we have the overlap, we don't need to fell that down. There's nothing stopping you, but it's no bother. Leaving it open also gives greater flexibility. At the bearer, just finish felling the top of the line, the top of the waistband, fastening the thread underneath the silesia. Do the bottom side of the waistband, starting from underneath the bearer, the bearer's silesia, and simply fell all the way across to where we started. When we get to the pleats, we should th fell through as much as of the silesia as possible without straining ourselves but also tacking the top of the pleats together at the center back. At the bottom of the fly bearer, start with fastening the bit you folded up behind the fly and guard earlier. Cross or blanket stitch it, tack it even. Make sure that nothing you don't want visible isn't visible, basically. I'm cross stitching across, and when I get to the end, I sort of do a tack before moving on, so without cutting and starting a new thread. Proceed then to prick stitch it to the seam allowance. We could also, or in lieu of that, fell the guard silesia to the trouser lining. Getting to the top, level with the bottom of the curtain, I'm prick stitching across my folded edge, stitching the silesia to the curtain. Then you get to the curtain, just fell it to that, then the waistband lining. At the top of the waistband, fell across the top of the guard lining to the waistband. Finally, down a little beyond where we cut the machining stitch, securing the thread in place. We chalked where we had cut the seam on the bearer, so chalk those onto the silesia and chalk on the waistband seam. We'll cut the silesia like a pocket opening, cutting a small hole in the centre and cutting towards both sides of the hole, stopping short to cut mitres, making sure we have a bit of space before the pressed up seam allowance inside, and only the pressed open seam that we cut down is visible through the hole that we're making which is where the chalk markings come in.
We need to fold the small amounts of silesia under themselves up into the corners that we cut so that the raw edges aren't exposed. We need to press them in place since we can't really base them down, but come to think of it, we should have based it around where the hole was going to be. Might have been easier. Bear with, this is literally the first time I made this kind of hole. Never, never even seen it done, just seen the result. I tried using my scissors to poke the seams underneath themselves. We should use our button to check that the hole is big enough before felling and tacking the perimeter. We're going to cut the waistband seam so we need to secure either side. I would suggest felling all four sides of our rectangle of silesia to the bearer and waistband seam allowances before doing the tacks. But I did the tack first, filled across the second side and then filled the rest. While the tacks holding either side of the hole together should be visible from the outside, we don't want the felling visible, as is the norm for both. Once secure, we can cut open the hole. Snip the waistband stitching between the tacks, open, clearing it away as though it were never sewn. Final check that it's big enough for your button. Do up the zip and hook and bar to find the position of the button. Use chalk holding the button hole down and mark the point of the bearer's hole furthest away from its trouser. We know the vertical location of the button, level with the waistband seam. I'll link off the Murray Sidwell button video, so I will gloss over actually attaching the button myself. doing up the button and hook to make sure it is in the right place. The button is there to take some strain off of the zip and hook and stop the waistband on the bearer from poking out above the waistband in front of it. You also fasten the curtain down from inside the pleat, secure it to the inlay at the back, to the back pockets or just the darts as appropriate, and keep the tacks kind of subtle. Now we'll prick stitch the pocket opening. It might have been easier earlier, but we'll leave it to now because this is how it's done. A lot of tailor shops have dedicated finishes, hand sewing experts. You can do these little bits when they first come up, but it's better for me to structure this doing it as a finishing section. Get scot of any thread markings that are in the way. Start with a bar tack at the bottom or top of the pocket. 
Stitch through everything, giving either side of the bar maximum purchase to hold the two together. Then, coil the thread around the bar gently, pulling the thread away from where you started. Finishing the bar and starting the prick stitch up the pocket opening, maybe half a centimetre from the edge. Finishing in the same manner we started. The prick isn't just for decoration, it's to hold and set the edge. It will stop the facing from peeking out from behind the front of the trouser, in the exact same way that the basting is right now. Prick stitching, make sure you catch through the facing, otherwise it's basically half worthless. I can't see, I can't, I can't see the needle showing in the footage, but it's definitely visible taking a prick of the facing to hold it down. Bar tack at the other end of the pocket and fasten the thread somehow neatly, I defer to you. Clear the remaining thread marks and basting just to neaten it up. We should have prepared the J-stitch earlier, like I mentioned probably an hour ago. Yeah. <laughs> For both of us actually. To prepare it we need to baste the fly to the trouser. Easiest over a ham or sleeve board since the back trouser wants to be in the way behind it. Make sure that the fly and the trouser are flat together. We don't want either pulling or rumpling the other. And we don't want the trouser to be eased almost at all between the stitch and the centre front. I'm not pulling the trouser fabric over the fly, I'm just making sure there is little to no ease. I'm tapering the seam as I get towards the notch. We absolutely should chalk the J-stitch on to follow a line. The generic measurement is 3.5cm at the top and the same all the way down until it curves into the bottom of the seam where the notch is. Interestingly, the math says that our prick stitch should be just about hidden in the same way as the sink stitch between the silesia on the fly. Doesn't seem to work out that way most of the time though. So this time I'm measuring how far the silesia on the fly is from the edge and measuring the same amount to the from the front of the trouser. Try to make as fine a line as possible so that you can follow it with pricks most easily. Having finally prepared it, now is actually time to finish the J-stitch. Secure the thread out of the way on the inside. Just prick stitch along that line, fixing the fly to the front trouser. When we get to the top of the seat seam where the J-stitch should be ending, we will do a bar tack in order to keep them securely together. Make a few stitches across everything. Coil the thread around the bar gently, using the blunt side of the needle underneath the bar, pulling the thread away from where we started, but pushing the thread up the bar a little bit with our finger. Pulling the coil tight, and we only need to make three or four coils this way. I'm securing the thread by doing a few pricks back up my J-stitch and cutting away the tailing end, though we could also send the needle to the reverse to secure and hide it as discreetly as possible on the fly or bearer. On the fly side on the centre front, we need to prick stitch down, the, down to the notch. 
Start at the waistband and bar tack between the waistband and the fabric. Tack through everything to make a bar and coil around it. And this might have been my best example of making a bar tack if it weren't so grainy. Quick stitch right along the edge all the way down to the notch and just secure the thread. Again, like the pockets, it's to fix the seam so that it stays bled into the wrong side and doesn't become visible at any point. So we need to sew through all the layers to fix them together properly. At the bottom, secure, the, secure and hide the thread anywhere you happen to see fit. We need to prick stitch the fabric that we rolled towards the zip on the bare side. Fasten the thread somewhere discreetly at the top of the waistband. Send the needle to the front and right along the edge of the folded up fabric, prick stitch the fabric to the zip tape. Doesn't really matter if we take more, but we don't want this stitch to be visible on the back. When we get to the bottom, again, we're just securing the thread discreetly. We need to tack the flying barrow together, just sew a bar tack near the bottom of the flying barrow. I say about level with the bottom stop of the zip. At the fork, you'll fasten the seam allowances and sticky out bits of the inside leg inlay to the inside leg inlay. Sew the seam allowance up to the inlay too, and don't catch the outside trouser. If we'd overlocked the pieces, then we could cross stitch over following the half centimeter seam that is overlocked. We'd almost always cover the fork with something, so aesthetic it does not need to be. We could either trim down any of the side seam inlay that's sticking out from the seam allowance, or just cross stitch it down to the rest of the seam allowance. Cross stitch both sides obviously, without catching the outside trouser fabric, only stitching the seams to the inlay and seam allowance. We can skip across the seam instead of starting and ending two different stitches. It's the kind of thing and philosophy that, of saving a few seconds with each pair adding up over time. If you, if you did this for a living, it's helpful. In my situation, it almost doesn't matter. 
On the top of the fork, we need to make a square of lining. With a piece of lining about 16 by 30 centimeters, fold it in half inside out, or enough to create a 14 by 14 centimeter square. Essentially, measure from under the fly to the inside leg seams. Double that, and that's about the dimensions of the square you want. Close almost all of the seams so that it can be folded inside out, which will be felled closed. Iron it flat with the seams on the inside. Place the square onto the fork with the first corner hidden up underneath the fly and bearer. Tack it to the seam allowance there. Then, on a diametrically opposing corner, tack it to the trouser inlay and or seam allowance. But we need to make sure there's enough slack. Maybe hold it to a position on the seam allowance and pull it every which way so that you know whether it would pull. If it doesn't, then tack it there to the seam allowance too. Following that, either side to the inside leg seam allowance is following the same principles. Mine was actually tight and the tacks got torn out three times now. To finish the back pocket, we need the D-tacks. Might have done this before I put the second pocket back on, but this is better for video structure. More the thread on the inside of the pocket next to where the jets start and end. Send the needle through next to the corner. From the front, send the needle back in and about the same place. It's fastest to pull the needle through only a little and send it back up to the next location and then pull the thread through. Repeat in a semicircle with about eight total pricks to the other corner. Then we should go across the welts as well. It's a reinforcement stitch, might as well reinforce the cam. Plus, sewing across we can clean up the corners if necessary. 
pull any loose bits of the weave back into the seam. Fasten the thread to the pocket again. To sew up the hem, knot the end of the thread and start at the peak of the folded triangle, securing the thread underneath the fold. fell up that seam without catching through to the outside of the fabric. At the top do a small tack and you could basically secure the hem up however you feel like. I'm going to do a kind of blanket stitch. I'm securing the thread a little bit at the top, either 5mm from the edge or at the bottom of the overlocking as appropriate. Where the edge meets the trouser, directly above where the thread is secured, take a tiny amount of the fabric, more or less, as appropriate for tweeds and finer fabrics respectively. From the top, go along about a centimetre and under the folded up hem, coming through the fabric about 5mm below the edge or at the bottom of the overlocking. Going directly above to where the hem hits the fabric and take about the same amount again, then along, down, under and through and so on. Between each stitch there's no such thing as too dense, but there's a point of diminishing returns and there's how long it'll take you. About one centimetre is good, again more for tweed, denser for finer fabrics because of course we're taking less of the outside fabric, so we'll just take more lesses. When we hem across the inlays and seam allowances, we can just stitch to the seam allowances and inlays and don't need to take as much care to take as little as possible since it doesn't show through. We can keep going around like that until we make it back to the start. Make sure to stitch over the slightly overlapping portion where we folded the triangle and secure the thread, proceeding to hide the tail of the thread. We need to remove all the basting and marks that we want to get rid of before we iron the trousers. And any chalk markings for that matter. And fuck it, unlisted, uncut ironing video links in the description. Start at the top and it'd be advantageous to use a cushion while still making use of your sacrificial cotton. Then just use the heat to dry it off, making it as flat as me attempting to make a joke. Be sure everything is laying flat the pockets and curtains are flat, that all the seams are properly open, just work around the whole trouser just below the waistband. Ironing my trouser throughout, leaving it largely uncrumpled at any point, helps in the final project not being ruined by my ineptitude with regard to a final ironing. My plank of wood has been helpful in ironing abstract shapes and cosplays, but was slightly less useful here. I'm stuck using my block with a tiny surface area since I don't have a ham or sleeve board or anything and using an ironing board wouldn't make an aesthetic shot. I imagine you have an ironing board and you aren't trying to film a decent looking shot so you might find it much easier to use that using the same kind of principles.
we need to iron the waistband pockets and curtain from the inside as well. Lay the trouser legs flat, folded on the crease we already made obviously. Gently fold the first leg up and out of the way. Start with the hem, which should be flat, but we're reinforcing and really trying to cement the crease. Since the front and back creases should both really be in the correct places already, we can make a small part of the trouser flat that we need to iron at a time to press it properly flat. Gently flip the trouser over and press the other side of the trouser in the same way. following which we need to change legs, more importantly to gently fold the ironed leg away. If we shape the legs we can do it again, again just sort of cementing it, stretch out the calf and thigh again and shrink in the shin and hamstring again. When putting them on a hanger, we need to preserve the front and back creases, making sure that the point of contact of the trousers to the hanger is flat. Which might sound pretentious to say out loud. I've got to say, I'm really happy with this. I really hope my effort making the video is worth it. I'm doing this because it's what I really would have wanted half a decade ago. Uh, while I won't pretend that I wouldn't monetize my channel out the wazoo if I was able, it's a lot about trying to help the next me, the next person who wants to become a tailor. As a hobby, just to test it out, or even if you want to become a professional tailor. But I might be thinking too highly of my ability to teach there. It is still a lot for me. It's a very handy, very convenient aid memoir that has come in handy much more than a stack of paper or a book would. I never wanted to go to university and I really should have heeded this guy's warning, but I didn't and I'm not sure, not so sure I would go back and change it if I had found myself on YouTube to teach me. I feel that maybe there's a certain amount of discipline that you might lose if you don't have somebody looking over your shoulder. You need to have a measure of self-discipline to be straight with yourself and tell yourself when something's not quite up to scratch. Like I've said, be precise, be as precise as possible in each individual step and you will end up with a good pro end product. Like I've once said to my lecturer, I've made a lot of small mistakes that have just cascaded into a bad pair of trousers. Lastly, I want to say why I've made one long video instead of parts, a series. I have this video split into thorough and hopefully helpful timestamps. They function as a very basic step-by-step -step and clearly defines where all the steps are should we need to find them again. It's easier than multiple videos and I know because I've made a couple of jackets since my first one, since my video. Having to guess which video I wanted, then do like before and after, 
is a pain when I could just look through the timestamps and find exactly where I want to go.